Good evening. It's Wednesday night, time for Bible study again. I'm a little late recording my Bible study today because I had a lot going on today. Uh, so tonight we're going to look at Mark chapter 13. Before we start our study on the Olivet Discourse, I uh, just want to let everybody know that on May 24th, this coming Sunday, we're still going to be doing a drive-in worship, uh, weather permitting. I know there's some rain forecast for Sunday, but weather permitting, we'll do outdoor service uh, this Sunday. May 31st, we're planning on going inside the auditorium. We're going to rope off every other pew, and we're going to attempt to do worship in person. And also, we'll be doing it live on Facebook. We'll do it on our live phone stream. And we'll also be broadcasting on our radio station for anyone that would like to come and sit in the parking lot. So that's the plans going forward on our worship. Uh, so tonight, uh, let's begin our Bible study with the word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity we have to study your word. I thank you for uh, the scholars that have studied and uh, present the information for us. And God, I pray that as we look into your word, that uh, God will find the application that you have for each one of us, and that God will be blessed by your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Mark chapter 13, the Olivet Discourse. Jesus on the Mount of Olives is speaking with his disciples after he leaves Jerusalem. This is a chapter that has a lot of different opinions, a lot of different thoughts, a lot of different interpretations. Uh, so one thing as I studied, I conclude that there's no need for me to be dogmatic about what I say about this chapter. I'm going to present it to you the best I can. But if someone wants to uh, disagree with me or dispute a point, that's fine because even the ones that have studied it uh, dispute some of the information there. Uh, Tonight, as I present it, I'm going to present two opinions. We're going to look at one, but the two opinions that I come down to are, are from two theologians that I trust and respect, and one of them is R.C. Sproul, and the other is John MacArthur. Uh, as I've done the study, R.C. Sproul believes that every event that takes place in Mark chapter 13 has already taken place. Uh, R.C. Sproul believes that uh, in A.D. 70, when the temple fell, all the events that take place in chapter 13 have already taken place by that time. When it talks about the coming of the Lord, uh, the day of the Lord and the coming, he believes that's uh, God's uh, judgment over Judaism, and so he concludes everything has taken place. He has historical facts to back that up, uh, so if you'd like to read that commentary, you can come by and let you borrow the commentary and read the historical facts. Uh, also, uh, I want us to think about John MacArthur's study here, and that's the one we're going to look at tonight going forward as we look at uh, John Mark chapter 13. Now, based on everything that I read in the chapter, I really come down to thinking uh, that I would agree with R.C. Sproul's opinion that it's all taken place. And the thing that really makes me feel that way is verse 30 of the chapter where Jesus says, that Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now, if Jesus says this generation, what is he talking about? It's a stretch to say this generation is more than the ones he's talking to. So because of verse 30, I would lean. I'm not going to say I'm going to drive a stake, and I'm going to believe that way, but I would lean and believe that Jesus is talking to his disciples here, and he's trying to warn his disciples about the coming persecution and judgment of Judaism, uh, and I think it probably is all going to take place. But that aside, uh, I'm going to look at John MacArthur's presentation of the chapter because it works better for us. Uh, and we know that sometimes with prophecy, there's a present fulfillment and a future prophetic fulfillment. Uh, we see that in the Old Testament a lot. So as we make application, we're going to be looking there at what John MacArthur has for us on outline. Uh, but as we begin, what I want to do is I want to look at the text and read the whole chapter. So I'm going to be scrolling through here and you can read as I go along. And I'll do the best job I can to read this. So it begins, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. 
Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination of, that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand then. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in the winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short these, those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to be deceived, to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, we will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer's near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and death will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, we do not let him find do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. There's a lot happening there in that chapter. Now here's the way that John MacArthur divides the chapter. The first two verses deal with the destruction of the temple. Uh, verses 3 through 13 deal with present history. That would be what we're living in now, the church age. Uh, John MacArthur then says verses 14 through 23 describe the great tribulation period that is described in Revelation. And then the fourth section is verses 24 to 36, and John MacArthur would point that to be the second coming of Christ. I can go with that. And that's possible, uh, and that's the way we're going to break it down for our study. And tonight what I want to do is I want to look at the first two points, and that's the destruction of the temple and present history, of what these scriptures tell us about that. And the first we're going to look at 
is the destruction of the temple. Let me give you just a little bit of a history without getting too burdensome with history about the temple. We know that David wanted to build the temple. God said David couldn't build a temple, but David made the plans. David collected all the gold and everything that was going into the temple, and his son Solomon built the temple. Well, Solomon's temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. when Jerusalem fell and when Judah fell. So the temple was completely destroyed. When, Jerusalem, when the Jews went back to Judah after Babylonian captivity of 70 years, around 516 B.C., the Babylonians let them rebuild the temple. So the temple was rebuilt in about 516 B.C. Uh, in around, around 19 B.C., Herod began to remodel the temple and expand the temple. And we know Herod is a uh, Roman ruler here at this time. And the historians tell us that Herod remodeled this temple and made the expansion, and it was still going on in 70 A.D. when the temple was destroyed. So we're talking eight decades, eight to nine decades, this expansion was going on in the temple. It was large. It was bigger than the original temple. It took up much more area. It was more massive. They said some of the columns that you could take three men and they could wrap their arms around the column and fingertip to fingertip, three men could not reach around the columns in the front of the temple. That's how big it was. It talks there in our first verse when the disciple says, look at the wonderful temple, the buildings, and look at the wonderful stones. They said some of the stones could have weighed a, a million pounds in that temple. It was huge. And, and on the outside, Herod had overlaid everything in, in gold. And they said when the sun shined on it, you could see the temple from everywhere because it was the highest place in Jerusalem. So even from far off, you could see this temple shining brightly because of all the gold. And that's what uh, these men were talking about when they said, look at these buildings. Uh, so uh, as we think about that, think about this. At the time, Jesus, at the time that we're talking, the temple was known as Herod's temple. Think about that. It's not Jehovah's temple. It's not God's temple. It's not even Solomon's temple. They are calling it Herod's temple. As I thought about that, my good friend Jim Pazda used to pastor at the First Baptist Church Henrietta. Now, I'd always give him a hard time because their parking lot was the Homeland parking lot across the street. So I would always say, how's it going at the First Baptist Church by the Homeland? Or how's it going to the, by, at the Baptist Church by the Homeland? And he would get a kick out of that. But I can't imagine the Jewish temple being called Herod's Temple. Now as you think about the destruction of the temple, as we saw in the first two verses, uh, Jesus says... Uh, Get back to the right page. Jesus says to them, Do not see these, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now it's hard for us, but just imagine the Jewish religion, Judaism. Imagine Judaism without their temple. The temple is where every sacrifice was to be made. The temple was where the altar was. The temple is where the temple is where the high priest was. The temple is where the Ark of the Covenant was. Every the Holy of Holies is at the temple. Can you imagine the Jewish faith without the temple? And that's what he's telling these apostles. It's the end of the if, if the temple is gone, the sacrificial system is gone. And oh, by the way. The sacrificial system is gone because the temple's gone. They no longer sacrifice as they did in the Old Testament. One thing we know from, from this is the world system will pass away. The systems of this world will pass away. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, the scripture tells us, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 
everything of this world is passing away. And this Jewish faith that had become a, a religion of man was passing away. It had served its purpose. It was a foreshadow of Christ. One truth we see from these first two verses is Jesus' prophecy of the temple came true almost 40 years later. Here Jesus tells his disciples, and uh, we see that, that uh, they went out, and the next verses are going to say they went to the Mount of Olives. So they came out of the temple, they went down through the valley over to the Mount of Olives, and they looked back across. And Jesus says, that temple is going to be destroyed. Every stone. He said, not one stone is going to be left on another. Now think about 40 years it took to, to come to pass. I wonder if anybody ever lost the faith thinking, he said it was, but it ain't yet. You know, today we know Jesus is coming back and people still say, I don't know. Everybody keeps saying, every generation says he's coming back. Listen, one generation is going to be right sooner or later. So, Jesus' prophecy is fulfilled, even though some may doubt it. And as I thought about 40 years, and the temple was still there, what would anyone say? What would we have thought if someone a year ago had said, there's coming a pandemic to the world? And it's going to shut everything down. It's going to kill thousands of people. And it's going to shut down restaurants. It's going to shut down bars. It's even going to shut down the casinos. And it's going to shut down the churches. And it's going to shut down major league sports in America. And six months rock by and nothing happened. I think... They'd be laughing at that guy saying, what does he know? Jesus said that the temple is going to be destroyed. And 40 years later, his prophecy was fulfilled. The second point that we have tonight is, is the present history. John MacArthur says, verses 3 through 13, deal with the present history. Uh, <clears throat> there in verse 3 or verse 4, the disciples ask, Jesus a question. They said, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Matthew records the same question. Matthew says this, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So that's the question that Jesus is answering. Uh, what when will this take place, and what will be the sign that it's happening? And you're coming in the end of the world. So if you looked at verse chapter 24, verse 3, you would think the end of the world, maybe we'd lean toward John MacArthur's interpretation of Mark chapter 13. So, as we look at these verses, 3 through 13, I won't go back and read through them, but if you read through them closely, and you look at the book of Acts, you can go right through the book of Acts and you can line up all the things that are talked about in Mark chapter 13, verses 3 through 13, and they all line up with the events that take place in the book of Acts, the persecution of the church and, and the killing of the people. Uh, in our text tonight, it said they're brought into the synagogue and they are killed or they're persecuted in front of the synagogue. That doesn't happen today, but it happened in the book of Acts. You know, Paul, when he was a Pharisee, he led that. Uh, he led people in, because of the church into the synagogue. So we want to look at some of the things that he tells us are going to happen in this present age. And the first thing that we see is Jesus tells us to beware of false prophets. There in verses 5 and 6. He says, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, and he will deceive many. 
Beware of false teachers. You don't have to go very far today to know there's false teachers. You flip through the TV channels, you flip through the radio stations, and you hear people uh, talking about things that you just scratch your head and say, I don't know that that's in the Bible. But yet people believe it because people aren't grounded in the Word of God. He says, beware, take heed that no one deceives you. It happened in that day. There were many that came after Jesus and said, I am Jesus. There were many people that claimed that. But the first thing that's, that happens in this period is, is we know there's false teachers. The next thing he talks about is there's wars and rumors of wars. In verse 7 it says, But when you hear the wars and rumors of war, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So there's going to be wars. And some would say, you know, there's wars and rumors of war. That means it's in time. Jesus says, listen, there's wars and rumors of wars, but do not be troubled, for such things must happen, and the end is not yet. Now, as I've read and, and I've studied this verse, historians tell us there's never been a day on earth, on the history of earth, that there's not been war. We know in our own lifetime there's been war there's always war and as far as we can tell there'll never not be war in the Middle East because the Muslims are always going to be against the Jews so there's always going to be war that doesn't mean that's the end but listen in this time there's going to be war then Jesus says there's going to be natural disasters at the end of verse 8, it says, And there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. I hear lots of people say, Oh, there's earthquakes, and, and the weather's going crazy. It must be in times. Jesus says it's the beginning of sorrows. And I think uh, one text may tell us it's the beginning of birth pains instead of the beginning of sorrows. Uh, let me see. I think that. Let me see my note here. Uh, I can't see it there, but I think that might be it. But the beginning of birth pains. Now, let me ask you, ladies. Are the beginning of birth pains, those first contractions, are they the same as the ones at the end? My wife's shaking her head saying, no. They're not. And he says, this is the beginnings. So there's going to be... Natural disasters, there are going to be earthquakes. All these things are going to happen because that's part of creation. Also in this present history, it says there are going to be religious and civil persecution. Verse 9, it says, Watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. Now with this one, let me ask you. Has anybody been beaten in a synagogue lately? Not that I've heard of. But we know in the book of Acts there were lots of people. We know Jesus was beaten in a synagogue. We know Paul was beaten in a synagogue. Many of the Christians in the book of Acts were beaten in a synagogue. But there's going to be religious persecution. There are going to be other religions. I mean, today, you can't help but know there's a Muslim Christian Friction because they don't go together. Listen, the Muslim faith says Jesus is the Antichrist. We say otherwise. But there's going to be religious persecution. We see that around the world today. Many people are being martyred for the faith. But there's also going to be civil Persecution. He says, you'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake and for a testimony to them. The government will persecute Christians in this time. Verse 12 tells us there's even going to be family betrayal. It says, now brother will betray brother to death and a father his child and the children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Family betrayal. If you really want to see this today, you can read the Voice of the Martyrs magazine. You can look at some of the 
stories coming out of the Middle East and, and how when someone puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, their own family betrays them. Their own family might even kill them because of their faith. But in this present history, in this present time, there's going to be family betrayal because of the faith. And in verse 13, Jesus tells them, you're going to be hated by all. And, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. He says, you'll be hated for my name's sake. In our religion today, in our Christianity in America today, we do a lot to try to get people to like us, to come to church. Listen, you ask a lot of people, success of a church is if you have the auditorium full of people. And the, right, the way you get an auditorium full of people is you tell them what they want to hear. Listen, if we preach the word of God, as God proclaimed it, they're not going to be flocking to the door to come in. He says, we're going to be hated by all. And those are some of the warnings that he gives of what's going to take place. And I think if we look at Scripture, we need to make points of application. We can't just look at Scripture as history and let's just look at what Jesus said. We need to make some points of application. Now, what is Jesus telling the disciples in regards to what he's telling them about what they're going to live through? The first thing Jesus says in verse 5 is, is, see that no one leads you astray. See that no one leads you astray. Let me tell you how that works. You get a copy of the Word of God, and you open it up, and you read it. You get some study materials from theologians that you trust. And you read some information about the scripture. But you get to know what the word of God says so that one day when you're sitting in the pew and someone in the pulpit says something that doesn't make sense, there's a bell that goes off in your brain and says, listen, that's not what I read. And then you won't be deceived. But if we sit back and wait for people to feed us and we wait for people to tell us what to think, we will be deceived. And don't forget, God gives us the Holy Spirit to interpret the Word of God to us. So don't be led astray by false teachers. The second thing that we see, and we see this many times in this chapter, Jesus says, be on your guard. Be on your guard. One thing we know, Jesus tells us, or Peter, I think it's the one that says, Peter says, the devil, his schemes are, are crafty, and he hides behind a bush waiting who he can devour. We need to be on guard. We need to be alert. We need to be watching, knowing that, listen, the enemy's out there, and we've got to be ready for the enemy. We need to look over in Ephesians 6 and put on the armor of God and realize we don't battle with flesh and blood. We battle with principalities and powers and rulers of the air. Listen, we have a spiritual battle going on, and if we're going to win that battle, we must be on guard. And not <coughs> just treat life as the lazy river. We're in our inner tube and just floating down the river. No, we have to be on guard. We need to be swimming upstream. The next thing that we see in verse 10 is we need to proclaim the gospel in this time. Now, the scripture there in verse 10 says, The gospel must be preached to all nations. The gospel must be preached to all nations. Now, I have made this quote, and I've heard many people tell us, The end will come when the gospel is preached to all nations. Now, I want you to think, if Jesus makes this statement at this time, and the disciples go out and preach the gospel to all the known world they know, Europe, Asia, wherever the, the, they know there's history. Paul takes his missionary journeys, and the gospel goes out by the apostles in the book of Acts. I wonder if maybe the gospel could have been preached to all nations in the book of Acts. And this not be about the second coming of Jesus, but about the time of Acts and the, and the expansion of the church. 
The next thing we see that we see in verse 11 is that we need to let the Holy Spirit speak through us. Now, if we're going to let the Holy Spirit speak through us, we're going to have to be filled with the Spirit. But he tells them in verse 11, When they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now these apply to us just like they would have applied to them back then. We proclaim the gospel. We let the Holy Spirit speak through us. That's where prayer comes in. Prayer, God, give me the words to say that I might say the right thing in this situation. There's times I go to the door of a house. Now, there's lots of great methods of sharing the gospel. And you can memorize the plan. I know uh, there's the ABC plan. There's the three R's, uh, repent, receive, and realize, repent, receive. Realize your sin, repent of your sins, and receive Jesus Christ. There's many different ones. But, you know, we could go in with a canned speech, and this is what I'm going to tell them about Jesus and, and see if they'll accept him as Jesus Christ, as their Lord. And we go in... And we fumble over the words. But we could prepare ourselves. We could pray and say, God, give me the words I need to say to touch this, piece, this person's heart. And then we rely on the Holy Spirit to lead us and to deliver that message. So he says, let the Holy Spirit speak through us. And the next one is stay faithful. Here in verse 13 it says, he who endures to the end shall be saved he who endures to the end shall be saved as I study the New Testament and I study the scriptures if we don't stay faithful to the end we weren't saved John tells us they went out from us because they never were of us I know of people that I've gone to church with that today they profess to be atheists. They didn't stay faithful to the end. I don't know that they were saved. And you see, I think as he's talking to the disciples here, he's telling them, listen, if a person truly believes in Jesus Christ, They'll remain faithful to the end. Unbelievers who profess to believe are not going to be faithful to the end. Those in church that aren't saved, they won't, they won't be faithful to the end. It made me think of the, the story of the Columbine shootings. And I, I picked a paragraph up out of the story, and the paragraph says, In a perverse celebration of Hitler's birthday, Two heavily armed students stormed through the Colorado High School on April 20th, 1999, killing as many as many people as they could. Confronting 17-year-old Cassie Bernal, they put a gun to her head and asked, Do you believe in God? She said yes. And the story says the killer laughed and pulled the trigger. True believers will say yes. Let's pray. Father, as we navigate through this fallen world, Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom that we're not led astray. Father, that you would help us to be on guard. And God, Father, give us the boldness to proclaim the gospel. Father, May we let the Holy Spirit speak through us to other people. And Father, we pray that you continue to give us the faith to stay faithful. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.